So my business partner, Brandy, recently recommended a podcast series to me called The Telepathy Tapes. And I wasn't really quite sure what I was going to be diving into. Um, and so I started listening to them and they were just absolutely fascinating. So for those of you who have yet to um, listen to the telepathy tapes or go into that, I encourage you to, because I'll, I'm going to talk over a couple of videos here about, you know, some observations or some connections and some dots, dot connecting I've done from listening to the telepathy, telepathy tapes and just what I've learned about things like morphogenetic fields, which I'm going to go into. And so just as a brief summary, the telepathy tapes were recorded by, or I would say produced by a woman named Kai, who became fascinated with this idea that there were um, instances where nonverbal autistic children were able to read people's minds. They're either their moms or their caretakers or their teachers. And uh, she um, basically got in touch with a researcher who is still studying this field. Call, uh, the woman's name is Diane Powell. And Dr. Powell um, was beginning to like really die, like basically do some, what we would consider more rigorous testing of this phenomenon. And what I love about the telepathy tapes is because a lot of people I think are skeptic about telepathy, uh, which is fine. You have every right to be skeptical. Um, but what this, what this researcher was doing and what, what both Kai and Diane were really trying to ensure through their observations and their testing of these nonverbal autistic children and their, um, possibilities of telepathy was that they really controlled the environment, right? They made certain that there were no uh, no mirrors, there were no microphones. They really laid out uh, it, it very extensively how much they did in order to ensure that the results from the, these telepathy tests were not happening due to some form of fraud. And so they even brought skeptics into the uh, the recordings. You know, for example, the so one of the individuals who was doing the actual videotapes of the telepathy tape, so was recording the sessions, was in fact a self-proclaimed skeptic. And I say was because he has since realized, oh my goodness, there is something going on here. And so basically the telepathy tapes have a series of tests all over the country, you know, from, uh, let's say, New Jersey to Georgia. There was an individual in Mexico, right? So all over the world, even they talked about uh, various um, uh, instances of telepathy in, in nonverbal autistic children and now grown adults as well, nonverbal adults in the UK. I mean, so this is happening all over and uh, they really did a good job just kind of like visiting each of these locations and running these children you know, with their, like these, these children were enjoying this, you know, made sure that it was okay with them, running them through a series of tests to basically show, yes, I can read my mom's brain. Or yes, you know, you can rearrange those cards in any order and I can tell you what they are. Or you can use a random number generator and generate a five digit number and I can tell you what number you generated. So these are, these were just fascinating. You know, I, I love this because what this does is it gets us out of the concept of we are only our physical bodies. And over the course of the past, you know, I would say three years or so, my, my interest has gone from the physical body, which I love. I still think we need to tend to our physical bodies, which is why I talk extensively about light and circadian rhythm. It's why I talk extensively about the water inside of our bodies. And it's why I also still talk extensively about mitochondria. However, through understanding the water inside of us as a liquid crystal, in a liquid crystalline state, that fourth phase of water, that exclusion zone water, that liquid crystalline water that can act as an antenna. Liquid crystals of all sorts are used, you know, in the physics literature as literally antenna to receive and broadcast energy and information. And so with us being these basically 99% uh, water by molecular count, we are living liquid crystals, meaning perhaps water in that liquid crystalline state also gives us an opportunity to receive and transmit energy and information that might not be picked up just by our five senses. And so the telepathy tapes were a dive into this. Now, also, I've got a friend and colleague who has a nonverbal autistic daughter um, who, has said, who, who has shared with me things, you know, throughout our friendship. So I had an idea that this was happening with the nonverbal autistic population. But I had no idea, it appears as though this is happening with all of them. And I had no idea that the accuracy of this telepathy was darn near 100%. And it went deeper than that. 
what I found most fascinating about these telepathy tapes was this idea that there was a grid that was, or, you know, basically a, a, an invisible location, if you will, where these um, individuals could go, not with their physical bodies, but through their mind, they could gather and they could um, just communicate with each other and hang out. It was like a hangout. It's a hangout location for nonverbal autistic people. And all the nonverbal autistic people have an opportunity to do that. Uh, and so I began to think like, what's going on here? Like from my understanding, and it for me invoked this idea of this field that connects us all. And so we do have this field of energy and information that interconnects everything. It is called, it's been called lots of names. I re typically refer to it as the ether. And this ether, we have to be aware of, has very special properties. So we can derive energy from the ether. Uh, we can essentially travel in the ether, not through our physical bodies, but like what these individuals are doing through maybe mental bodies into this ether. And there can be uh, locations that can be that people can go to. This is not unheard of. Um, but the way that I want to all to act, kind of enter this conversation, because I have a feeling we can continue to talk about this type of a thing. I think it's an important thing to bring to people's attention. And I think I think a lot of people are ready and interested in this. Um, and so in order to kind of dive a little bit deeper, I want to talk about specifically one field, because this ether is a unifying field. But there are subfields within this ether. And one particular field um, has been called the morphogenetic field. And actually, there's morphogenetic fields as well, essentially different categories of morphogenetic fields. And in the telepathy tapes, they referred specifically to a researcher whose name is Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert Sheldrake is the person who came up with this concept of morphogenetic fields. And so essentially a morphogenetic field, in my definition of it, kind of just paraphrasing from Sheldrake's work, is that there is a there are species specific fields of information and likely energy as well that can be tapped into that or that ultimately go to the collective consciousness of all of that particular species as a means of potentially maybe helping that species to evolve or or, or gather new information share share information share knowledge and he called it the morphogenetic field or fields and i want to talk about a couple of experiments there that were very interesting that led to basically the development uh, and the continued progression of developing this theory the first one is called the 100th monkey experiments. And this was actually done by researchers who were observing monkeys who lived on an island. And these monkeys were on this island and this island, they they loved sweet potatoes. And so these researchers would give the monkeys sweet potatoes. You know, they basically dump them off the sweet potatoes, but the sweet potatoes would get all sandy. And the monkeys hated the sand on the sweet potatoes. And so you could see the researchers observing these monkeys who just kind of not enjoying the grittiness of the sand, but wanting to get in to the sweet potato to eat the inside of it. Well, one day a, a monkey decided that it wanted to dip the sweet potato in water a couple of times. And so it started to dip the, the sweet potato in water and found out that when it dipped the sweet potato in water, there was no, there was not as much sand on it. And it was much more enjoyable to eat the, to eat the sweet potato. And so what the researchers observed was that this monkey was showing this technique to other monkeys. And those monkeys were then like able, also able to say, oh, okay, this looks like a really great way to eat our sweet potatoes in a more enjoyable fashion. And so they began to dunk the sweet potatoes in the water as well and eat them. Now, what was most fascinating about this wasn't not, I mean, I was impressed by the fact that this monkey learned this behavior and then was able to communicate that learned behavior to other monkeys on the island. But what was very unexpected was the idea, was the fact that monkeys of the same species in other locations around the world started to wash their sweet potatoes and their food as well. And so it became this idea that, wait a second, Maybe this isn't just a learned behavior just for these monkeys on this island. Maybe somehow the monkeys in other locations were able to tap in to the fact that this was now a thing. Enough monkeys, essentially what I would call a critical mass of monkeys, were, had learned a certain behavior and that learned, that learned memory or that learned behavior didn't just stay in the brains and it didn't just stay on the island and instead became part of a field of information.
And monkeys around the world were then able to tap in to that field of information and make this just a natural behavior for them as well. And it wasn't just then monkeys. Like what's even interesting is you'll see similar stories about different species as well who let's say um there was this there was a species and uh there was a species uh, and i'm drawing a blank on whether it was a fox or whether it was a um it, it, it was, whether it was a bird i'm drawing a blank on the exact species but what was fascinating about this was that this particular species, um, pr prior to, I think it was World War I, they started to realize that, oh, look, we have these, um, the milkman puts the milk out on the stoop. So uh, I wanna make sure that I'm there at the stoop, ready to steal the milk before the owner of the milk actually goes out and gets it. And so these, monk these, these, these creatures were actually stealing the milk and found that that was an easier way for them to get nourishment. So they were able to essentially steal a bunch of milk from off of people's uh, front porches in order to nourish themselves. So it was a cool, again, a very cool thing, right? These, these animals observed the fact that milk was put out on the stoop at the same time each week or maybe each day, and they were able then to take advantage of it by taking it and then using it for their nourishment. Now, fast forward, there was a war and a war that lasted longer than the lifespan of these particular creatures and milk delivery stopped during the war. So essentially when the war was over and milk delivery started back up, this, there were no creatures who were living who had experienced that learned behavior. It was all of their offspring. Uh, none of them had ever been exposed to that milk delivery before. However, what blew researchers' minds was the fact that these animals still had that learned behavior. And as soon as the milk started being delivered and put on these porches, they began to steal the milk in the same way that their ancestors had, that were maybe a few few generations earlier. And so again, things that make you go, hmm, what's going on here? Is there more to my memories? Is there more to when I'm learning something new, does it just become my skill? Or am I somehow contributing to the betterment of humanity? Now, additionally, this is done in, there are some uh, studies that were done in mice. And let's say these were mice that were separated, say, from the distance of Australia and the UK. Um, so let's say mice in the UK were given a specific maze, basically a maze test. And mice were timed with this maze test to see how quickly it took them to complete the maze. And the first group of mice to do this took them a long time. It was a new maze that they were presented with. And so what they what researchers found was that, OK, well, actually, uh, they as they practice it, of course, they start to get better. And so the first time through, it's tough. But with practice, they start to do better, do better, do better, because they understand what to do to get through the maze. But what was very fascinating was when new, was when brand new mice in Australia were given that exact same maze, they ran through that maze as if they had practiced it just as the UK ones had done. They had taken a long, you know, they took a long time at first, but eventually they became more efficient. These ones in Australia were efficient right away. So again, this is an entry point, a starting point, maybe to a conversation about when I think thoughts, are they my thoughts only? When I learn new skills, are they just my skills? So do my words and behaviors matter more than it's, oh, it's just me. It's just affecting me. And just through my learning and my observations, I realize now that my thoughts and my words, of course, matter to me. My actions, of course, matter to me. But they're also contributing to a greater field of information that I think is also impactful to other people. And so again, this is just something that we can start talking about, but I want you to think about how with all of these experiments that were done and this concept of this morphogenetic field, what might be at play here? Is there in fact a species specific field of information that can be tapped into? Is this, are there fields of information and energy that can be tapped into for these individuals who can, who possess the gift of telepathy, who are able to essentially then also not stay in their brains, but yeah, keep their thoughts in their brains, but essentially use their energy to travel outside of their physical bodies in order to communicate and hang out. I absolutely think it's true. I absolutely think that this is a possibility. I, in fact, think that this is a possibility that people can maybe coach into themselves. Um, but these individuals just have, have this as a beautiful gift. 
and basically telepathy as the purest form of communication that exists. So I'll end the video here. Uh, I'd be curious your thoughts and we'll talk next time.